but I think we need sub paradigm shifts within paradigms. And what I mean by that is I don't think the paradigm shift of saying, don't ever think about nutrition anymore, only think about drugs and surgery is warranted. I don't think the paradigm shift of saying, don't ever think about behavior, community intervention, family intervention is warranted. Don't ever think about public health or policy. That's not warranted. I don't agree with those at all. What I do think we need to do is to say within the paradigms of behavior, community, family, policy, let's be honest. Let's look at Carolyn Somerville's data and others and say, there is no compelling evidence that any of this has had a meaningful impact. You can cherry pick here and there. You can say this policy led to differences in how much of that food was purchased in this context. Even if that's true, and sometimes those are a little shaky, those conclusions, say, did it lower obesity rates? And those have never been shown. Right. None of these taxation, none of the policies. So how, how do we how do we do that? I, I agree with you, by the way, and my own personal, because I think everybody has to have a personal sort of bias if they're being honest. My personal bias is that so many of these public health ideas on the surface just make a ton of sense. Like I I I, I can I can I can simultaneously hold true the follow uh, you know the following truths, right? Uh, which is on the one hand. I can completely see why it was logical in the uh, early to mid '90s to say we have to change the food environment. Mm -hmm. um, again, like you know, Richard Thaler's work, right? Another Nobel laureate mm -hmm. um, would suggest that that's the answer. You fix the environment, you make the default environment better, and people will opt into good choices. By the way, the default environment used to allow people to eat in a way that was clearly ad libitum and obesity rates were not what they were. So something about the environment 200 years ago or 100 years ago or even 50 years ago was significantly different from the environment today. It's not that our genes changed, right? Nobody would argue there's been such a genetic drift that the reason that obesity rates are two thirds as opposed to 10% is due to a change in our species. An environmental trigger or set of triggers seems more likely and therefore public health solutions towards those seem very logical. So we can hold that truth here. And then we have to be brutally honest with your assessment as well, the same as Caroline's assessment, which is this has been an abject failure. I mean, if at the end of the day, you're only measuring the outcome of interest, it hasn't changed. So, there, you know, we can say whatever we want, but the outcome of interest hasn't changed. Either people smoke less or they smoke more or they smoke the same. And it, that's the only metric that matters if smoking cessation is what you're after. It's not, do we collect more tax revenue? Are the commercials more or less favorable? Uh, do people you know, it's smoke less in restaurants versus not in restaurants? No, we care if people as a society smoke less or smoke more. Um, so given that, how do we still say, and I'm not saying I disagree with this, because again, my bias is there should be solutions in public health. But how do we know after 30 years and billions of dollars with no effect that we should stay within the paradigm of public health solutions and just abandon all of the ones we have when we don't really have a sense of why they failed? Right. So we definitely don't want to only rely on public health solutions. I would strongly oppose that. I agree with you that there is a superficial sensibility to the public health arguments that were made for the various things tried, and it was reasonable to try them. But I say superficial sens uh, sensitivity or sensibleness because everything that's true makes sense, as once we understand it. If we're wrong about something, then it didn't make sense. We just didn't understand that it didn't make sense at the time. Some of that is assumptions and it goes back to that public health thing. I had a wonderful lunch with the most generous, interesting person, Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize who a few years ago. recently passed away. Right, before he died. And he and his wife were uh, gracious enough to allow myself and Michelle Cardell, who now works at WW, was a former student um, with the group I led, uh, to take them to lunch. And we talk about obesity a little bit, and he's this great behavioral economist. And he says to me, without artifice, he says, well, I think this nudge stuff is really good. 
And, you know, so you could put things on the menu and that would make people eat less. And I say, well, that's a good idea. And some things like that are being tried and have been tried. And I said, but the big thing is compensation. Yes, you can get a person to eat a little less in this context, but then if they go home for dinner and they just eat more at dinner, it goes away. And he looks at me without artifice and he says, hold it a second. So you're telling me that there might be mechanisms in people that lead them to adjust for a a reduced previous behavior. calories. Yep. And I said, yeah. <laughs> and this was a revelation. He said, you've opened my eyes. And I was an economist. He didn't think about this. He's great with math and he's great with creative study designs. But this was but, again, yeah, he doesn't understand physiology. Rushing in. Of course. So I think that was a big part. A lot of things didn't make sense because they didn't take into account compensation and many other factors. They didn't take into account magnitude of effect uh, and so forth. The second thing is the data themselves. People uh, published a nice thing about uh, a, a meta analysis of nudge type stuff in PNAS, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, a couple of years ago. Someone else just went in and redid it and said, if you adjust for um, publication bias, it doesn't look like there's much holding up there. So often we're presented with evidence, and we may want to come back to this when we talk about some other things like especially protein intake. We're presented with statements as though we confidently know these, and yet when you really start to open the hood and peel things back, you say, hey, there's not a lot of there there on the data. So the data that nudge works is actually shaky. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's the second problem. And the third is we seem to be unwilling to really learn from our mistakes. That is, or I shouldn't say mistakes, unwilling to learn from the outcomes of our studies. That is unwilling to say, we tried the school-based thing and it didn't get a big effect. We tried it again. Fair enough. Let's try it a second time. Let's try it a third time. At a certain point, we say enough. So if someone were to come to me, and I've been saying this for 20 years now, but I'll say it even more strongly today. Uh, if someone were to come to me and say, we, we've got this opportunity to invest in these big school-based, community-based, public health-oriented trials to reduce obesity levels in children or adults, and we have the money available, we want to do good, should we do it? And I would say, show me how this proposed idea is radically different than what's been done for the last 30 years. And then let's talk. And if it's not radically different, why are we wasting our time and money on that? So I think we really need radically different public health paradigm. We need to stay in the public health paradigm, but within the paradigm, we need a sub-paradigm shift to say, nutrition education, modest physical activity, build a little bit of a facility to allow people a little more activity. These have been tried, they don't work. They don't have big, meaningful effects. Let's try something completely different and it's worth a try. That's what I think we need within the paradigms of public health, policy, and so on. Radically different proposals. Now, if you were czar of the universe and the ultimate resource allocator, what percentage of resources would you put into a new and different form of public health, i.e. radically different approaches? And what percent would you put into medical treatments for, such as surgery and drugs? So first, I find it very entertaining to think about being the, the czar of anything, since my grandparents spent a lot of time successfully escaping the czars. Um, but uh, it's interesting that what I would say is probably a little more in the near term on the clinical treatment, because I think we can make more rapid gains in that while we need some slower, longer term assessment of the others. But also I would amp up the, the non-pharmaceutical, non-clinical, non-surgery a little bit, the funding from the government, because I think a lot of that funding for those other things will come from industry. So, you know, if you look at a budget of a Pfizer or a Lilly or a Novo Nordisk and what they put towards certain areas, and then you look at what NIH can put to those areas, we're not talking about NIH being this overwhelming big yeah. dog. And in fact, when you combine the pharmaceuticals on certain areas, they may be much bigger than NIH.